everyone. My name's Cornelia, and I'm here to interview Sean O'Donohue for the release of his brand new book, Courting the Wild Queen. So Sean, as many of you know, but some might not, is an herbalist and a writer, a teacher, and an initiated priest in two traditions. Sean's somewhat unique approach to healing weaves together the insights of traditional Western medicine and contemporary science. He regards the physical, the spiritual, and emotional healing as being very deeply intertwined. So poetry can fall from his lips as easily as his herbal insights and his prescriptions. So, Sean. You grew up near Boston, a short distance from where your grandparents first landed when they arrived from Ireland. And you are a devoted student of Irish history and folklore and graduated from Dartmouth College with a degree in English literature and creative writing. So this has given you quite a background for the writing that you are pursuing now. Yes, it was actually my great grandparents who uh, who 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 came over from Ireland. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah. Okay, okay. So in your book, you speak of sovereignty quite a bit, which I always saw as the king's right to rule by blood. But you take it to a much deeper level. Can you talk a little bit about this? Absolutely. Well, in the culture of my Irish ancestors, and in fact, in most of the cultures of Northern Europe and many cultures elsewhere as well, uh, sovereignty always arose from the kings being wedded to the spirit of the land, which was carried out quite literally in the king's initiation. And when, when, the, when the king was initiated into that wedding with the land, all of his life was devoted to the land and to the people. And so his capacity to weave together the mind and will of the people and to braid it with the will of the land itself uh, was the core of his function and all of the right that he had to, to lead and to guide and to hold together the community arose from that relationship. And all of that right would be forfeit if the king failed to honor the land and honor the people properly. And so this became degraded over time when the role of the king who had once really been a kind of priest who was weaving together the people in the land became instead a ruler in the modern sense. In the old sense, the king was never the maker of the law. The law was a living thing that lived apart from the king. The law was a song passed down with variations from generation to generation. The king was simply the one who united the people and spoke the will of the people in the land, but was, but uh, it, as this became degraded, and it no longer was that kind of priestly or oracular function, but instead became a rulership in the modern sense. And then when it lost its democratic moorings of being an office chosen by, by the people of the tribe to being one passed from father to son, then the idea of sovereignty beca became confused and lost and people began to think of it as the right to do whatever you chose without other influence, which is quite the opposite of what its origin was. 
And then when people finally rightly rose up against that institution and overthrew it and sought to invest sovereignty in the people, what uh, the mistake that they made was that they invested the degraded idea of sovereignty in the people. The idea that each person had, had the right to do what they wanted uh, rather than the, uh, what would be a truer recreation and democratization of the concept, which would be <laughs> that each person has a responsibility to the land and to the people and that all of our right to be, all of our right to act emerges from our being in that relationship. Do you see that in some ways, the love that many European uh, people have, whether it's England or Norway or Spain, that there is such a great feeling of uh, warmth that is extended to the royal family. Uh, do you think that part of that is a, is a leftover vestige of that old connection and that old relationship that still lives underneath all of the political chains that are now on, on royal families in terms of their power and what they can and can't do? Hmm. I see where your logic is going with that. I feel like my own feelings about the institution of the British monarchy are such that my mind and heart can't go there fully, but I can, <laughs> but I can see where you're going with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it was just a thought. It just a yeah, thought. absolutely. <laughs> it, it makes sense. I just don't want any anyone in my family spinning over in their graves. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. You know, what inspired you to, to write at this time on what most would see as a highly romantic and old world topic? I couldn't not do it. There was a strong insistence that I engage and confront this idea when um, our ancestor of the, of the craft, Gwydion Pentherwyn, began visiting me in visions and showing me the image of the sacred king existing in the old way. And when I found myself asking deep questions about the nature of authentic and healthy masculinity, in a culture that, in which such a thing had been hard for me to imagine. Um, it, I simply could do no other than follow uh, what my friend Stephen Buhner would call the golden thread. He speaks of this idea that comes from William Stafford by way of William Blake, that when sometimes there's something in your world that shimmers with a different luminosity than anything else. And if you follow the feeling and the quality of that light, it will be the golden thread that leads you to where you're called in a way that you could never quite imagine. So I followed that feeling and I followed that feeling uh, through times of upheaval, times of disruption, when all of my old worlds and all of my old senses of self were being broken open by events playing out in my life and events playing out in the world. Um, following that golden thread became a lifeline in many ways. Wow. Now, why, why do you think that people, uh, and why do you think it might be a good idea for modern people to read more poetry, um, historical as, as well as, as modern? Hmm.
When language becomes rhythmic, it allows us to open to a deeper kind of communication, mm -hmm. a kind of communication that reaches beyond just the frontal cortex of our brain where we're making meaning of words and into a deeper embodied place where we can actually begin to feel the truth that's being spoken. And poetry also um, is always, when done well, liberating. Because in our culture, we live with one story of one, of one level of reality that we call a literal or concrete reality that really is just one great metaphor that has colonized the collective heart and mind in such a way that it's hard to imagine outside it. And so when poetry begins to offer other maps of meaning, other senses of connection, and other ways of receiving language, it lets us break out of the cultural logic that has gotten us into the mess that we're in. Yes, I always have found that poetry, because there's so many different ways that you can do it and express it and write it, and uh, that it was it was like a um, a beautiful way and any and a, a unique way of being able to express all different types of emotions and thoughts and um, and also uh, to self analyze not only myself but also how i was perceiving the world and and that's a, a that's a real gift because it 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 orders you and it makes you contemplate in a way that actually then connects to the spiritual. Right, yes. And that connects with the way that everything else in the world speaks. <laughs> so I found it sadly ironic that um, this computer program that's believed to, by some, including by itself, to have become sentient, um, holds, uh, makes the argument that it is human because it uses language and it says only humans use language. And there's a deep, a deep and strange irony in that because in many ways, I don't question that something created by humans can become conscious in its own way or can use language, but it seems so strange to me that even though biology has demonstrated that not only other species use language, but that plants and fungi and even bacteria use structures of communication that you can only say are not language if you're, try if you're deliberately trying to limit things to the humans. Um, it seems very, it seems sad and strange that um, we are likely to recognize the machine as conscious and alive before we're, before we're likely to recognize collectively uh, the rest of the living world as intelligent and alive and speaking. Yes, yeah. Well, recently I read something where these um, uh, oceanography uh, uh, scientists that that they became completely shocked because they knew that dolphins uh, communicated with each other, but then they became aware that they actually had names yes. for each other. And they found out then that the orca also have names for each other. And now, you know, to their great like, oh, <laughs> they find out that uh, there's a good chance 
that uh, ravens and other corvids probably have names for each other as well. Yes. You know, it's a funny thing that the, the rationalist philosophy that guides science and our culture treats anthropomorphism as the greatest sin, says that the worst thing you can do from a rational standpoint is say that anything else is acting or thinking like a human. But right. at the same time, um, this is the same, another underlying principle of the same philosophy is Occam's razor, the idea that the simplest and clearest explanation is most likely to be true. And it's, and it's in order to avoid anthropomorphism, people tilt so far in the other direction to say that nothing else could possibly be like us. And they come up with such complex and convoluted explanations and justifications and redefinitions in order to do it. Mm, yes, indeed. I, I remember uh, getting into a head-to-head -head argument. I must have been maybe seven or eight with my local pastor. And when he tried to convince me that uh, animals do not have souls. Mm -hmm. And I related to him a story that my father had read me from the Reader's Digest of where a large cat, a large tomcat um, during a fire managed to drag a practically newborn baby out the window and onto a tree in order to be able to save the baby's life because the house was so filled with smoke. And, um, and so the pastor said, well, the reason that, uh, that, that animals and cats care for us and dogs care for us is because we feed them. And I said, but the baby didn't feed the cat. And then he said, well, then, uh, you know, uh, the cat was then an agent of God and God worked through the cat in order to save the baby. And I said, well, then the cat would have had to have had a soul so that God could have connected with the cat in order to say to the cat, drag the baby out the window. And, and he just looked at me and, and at that point just rolled his eyes and that was that. Yeah. <laughs> well, one of my first arguments with the clergy was when I was preparing for confirmation in the Catholic Church and I got into an argument with the parish priest because I was trying to talk with him about the possibility of other forms of intelligence in the world, and particularly about uh, the intelligence of whales and dolphins. And he said that no, um, we that humans are the pinnacle of creation. And while something else might be able to do some interesting things, there is nothing else that can be as intelligent or more intelligent than us. Which is interesting because from the standpoint, even from the standpoint of Christian theology, that's a fairly late notion. A lot right. of the early saints throughout uh, Western Europe uh, were known for preaching to, to, uh, to animals and especially to birds and, uh, because, and uh, to have held, held the belief that the news of the sacred belonged to everyone and everything. Mm -hmm. And really when Augustine comes in with his idea of the great chain of being, and we began saying, well, no, these other creatures don't really have souls, don't really have consciousness in the way that we do, then that becomes a a very that's a very dangerous beginning it, and we then it, move it to only some people have souls and we move to the land doesn't have any value aside from what it gives to humans but i think about what um oh i'm trying i'm forgetting his name the Jungian psychologist hillman uh mm -hmm. said uh that i heard uh, that I first heard repeated by Stephen Buhner, which is after the earth was declared dead, the autopsy could begin in earnest. Ooh. <laughs> so, 
So your book pulls together these unique rhythms that are, it's the rhythm of storytelling and it's the rhythm of, of analyzing and coming to logical conclusions. It's the rhythm of poetry and it is the rhythms of, of scientific thinking. And, you know, now in, in, well, in, even when I was a kid, you know, people so often see storytelling of any kind, let alone anything you might relate from your own life as a kind of bragging or being self-obsessed. How can, how do you think that we can overcome this attitude and feel free again to be real with each other in expressing our story? Hmm. Well, it helps to have never understood the rules to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> and in a lot of ways, um, all of how I write and speak and practice medicine and teach is inseparable from the fact that I'm autistic. And that uh, because my synapses are always branching in fractal ways, um, I have never been able to fully follow the form and structure of the logic of the culture. And I need to actually find the life and flow that animates the system rather than trying to remember and understand the rules. And so both um, my greatest gifts and my greatest challenges <laughs> arise from this. But I would say that um, from my perspective, it seems only logical that the personal is what we know and what we live, but that because who we are is inseparable from everything, um, what we experience personally influences, has relevance to all that is, and all that is, is constantly shaping and reshaping what we think of as personal. And so if we move out of the idea of a hierarchy of making some beings more important than others, and instead move into a curiosity about here I am living in this particular body with this particular personal history in this particular time and place. And here you are living in a different body in the same times in a place, well, in this exact moment, it's, it's sort of an interesting thing because we're in the same, both in the same place and not at all in the same place. Right. Uh, in, right. The same, <laughs> in the same shared etheric place with a different story and a different set of experiences. And that by understanding, by seeking to understand each other, we come to understand greater things. But I've never understood when people talk about don't bring in the political or don't bring in the historical or don't bring in um, the religious or don't speak, don't speak in metaphor because none of those divisions have ever really made any sense to me. There is nothing personal that isn't political and spiritual um, and woven into history. And mm -hmm. there is, because none of us are having the same experience, all of our attempts at communication are metaphor. Some people just use more unusual 
structures and roots and images than others do. Yes, yes. Um, my grandmother used to say that modern life now practice a kind of emotional and spiritual miserliness. And I thought, and I said, well, explain that to me, Alma. And she says, well, it's becoming harder and harder to share your story. And people don't want to hear their story and the stories that they have, they want to hold on to them tight and not talk about them. And I said, well, why not? And she says, well, because everyone has become too afraid of what everybody else thinks. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I also feel like the mythic has always been a very direct expression of the structure of reality of a particular people in a particular part of the world mm -hmm. and their relation to the living land around them. And mm -hmm. today, when um, I talk with someone about talking to a raven, yeah. they assume that I'm not speaking literally. Mm -hmm. and because if I were speaking literally, they would say, well, that's something out of myth. Or that's something out of fairy tale. And that was all only supposed to be allegorical. But mm -hmm. it was never allegorical. It was but always the reality. When people said Raven said this, it was because Raven said this. Right, right, right. Well, and and yeah, and, and there's, I am so happy that I was able to meet uh, most of my grandparents mm -hmm. and that they were able to pass on to me directly this uh, very rich tradition that included being able to speak to animals and to have the expectation that they would understand you and that you could do this with words, but that you could also do it with your mind and that it's something that you need to practice. And it's something that if you get emotionally damaged, you know, like, like my grandmother would say that if your heart, you know, became damaged, then you can very easily forget. And that so much of humanity, because they are in a state of emotional and spiritual and psychic damage, they have forgotten. And her words rang right back to me, you know, when Victor said very much the same thing. Mm, yes. And the really deeply sad irony in that is that those encounters with the wild are sometimes also the only thing that can heal that damage. Yes, yes. Yes, indeed, indeed. In fact, you know, you are initiated in, in two traditions. Uh, what do you feel that this has brought to your life and, and how it has affected uh, your writing? Hmm. So there are things that live in our bodies because they were passed down through DNA by our parents. There are things that are alive in our bodies because there was a trace of granite in the water that we drank and that became part of our bones. There are things that live in our bodies because they are the shape of how another person's presence is felt and that changed the rhythm of our heart. There are things that live in our bodies because when we speak words the same way they've been spoken before, they create the same resonance through our tissues and the same shape of the column of breath. And all of those things are part of everything we say and everything we do. And in the same way, um, the living currents that are these traditions are part 
of everything we are once we integrate them. Change everything in us actually at a biological level. And so nothing can be separated from them. And you know, this idea that we can separate out these different aspects of our identity is a very modern concept. Um, and I think about uh, the great corrective to that, that exists in one of my favorite passages from the Irish animist poet, John Moriarty, who said, to learn to speak is to learn to say that our river has its source in another world well, and that everything we might say about the hills and about the stars is a way of saying there are nine hazels that grow over the well in the other world where our river has its source. And today I went out to the woods to a wild spring where there was cold water pouring forth uh, from deep underground. And that water was water from the other world. It was water that had been underground for centuries. When it was uh -huh. raining, it came through the crowns of the great king pines that were once the vast forest here. That, and what trees are here now are very young, um, grown up after second and third clearings of the forest. Um, but the water that's, that's coming up still holds the memory of those ancient trees that were there. And in that same way, um, we are we as beings who are mostly water, our water that carries traces of very old memory, and that gets infused with knowledge and wisdom and understanding in different ways across a lifetime. And the the passing of a tradition through initiation is one very powerful way that that happens that changes everything about mm. the flow of who we are. How do you feel that your, your um, way of viewing the world, uh, your, your innate spirituality and the wisdoms that you have gained throughout your life, how do you feel that that has affected and balanced with your scientific leanings and ways of analyzing the world? Hmm. A lot comes down to how we define science. Yeah. And um, so if we are to define science truly, it is a pursuit of truth, no matter how strange, no matter how terrible, no matter how beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in some ways I was introduced to a tradition and a current of that in childhood in an unlikely way, which was um, being very young when Carl Sagan's Cosmos was on television. Right, right, yes. And yes, he yes. was one of the first people who made any sense to me in the way that he spoke about the world. And it was very interesting because when people think about Carl Sagan, they identify him very much with a kind of cut and dried rationalism. And he certainly was able to put things in rationalist terms, but he was also part of what made him great was that he was also able to speak the poetry that was another part of the science. Mm -hmm. And that even though he called himself an atheist in the sense that he didn't identify with any religion and didn't have anything that he called God, he was deeply spiritual in the sense of being completely devoted to the beauty of all that is, 
and to the pursuit and transmission of wonder. Mm -hmm. And it's also very interesting that um, there are many things about who he was that didn't come out until after he died, things like his friendship with Timothy Leary and <laughs> the, the ways in which he was very often dealing with people who um, seemed more marginal to the culture, but had important things to say and finding a way to translate those. And so that was a very big influence on me. And a part of what made me interested in and passionate about science as a child was seeing that work that he was doing and seeing the same kind of work in other areas. Uh, John Lilly's work on the intelligence of dolphins, Robert Payne's work on the, uh, on the songs, or was Roger Payne's work on the songs of the humpback whales. Uh, all of these, all of these pursuits of knowledge were really about trying to understand how the world itself was speaking and where those other intelligences existed. And then when I, as I matured, I found that most of what was being called science was, re, uh, was rejecting that reality and following a, as much of a narrow dogma as any religion does. Uh, just happening to be a religion, happen, just happening to be a rationalist dogma that would actually make irrational arguments uh, in order to exclude anything outside its purview. And so for a long time, I rejected science. And then I came back to it as I began working with plants at first out of frustration because people would come to me with things they had read in a scientific study somewhere. And I would think, well, that doesn't add up. And I feel like that's really reductive. And so I had to relearn the science in order to figure out, well, is this true? And what's the problem here? And what I found was that if you follow things to where truth actually leads and ask enough questions and allow what you're actually perceiving and engaging to guide what you conclude, then science actually ends up coming full circle to prove most of the most ancient mythic understandings of people around the world. Uh, but if you allow the dogma to stifle it, then you will come up with complex, not entirely rational explanations to place limitations on things, or you will engage in poor methodology and make extrapolations that aren't justified by the data or the method. And so um, I retaught myself the language and the framework of science so that I could try to bring it back into its original purpose and original context. Mm -hmm. you, know, you reminded me of a memory uh, that I had when, uh, when my husband John uh, took me to see uh, Timothy Leary, whom he knew. And there was Timothy, you know, stalking the stage like a panther. And, um, and he then stopped and turned around and looked at the audience and he said, We've got it all wrong. He said, it's a goddess. It's a goddess, man. And she poured out her love to the god. And then they did the wild dance. And here we all are. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you made me think of that. Well, and I think about... Um how Victor spoke of uh, the goddess beholding herself in the curved mirror of time and space, mm -hmm. and falling in love with her own reflection, and how just a few years ago, looking at the 
data about how gravity, the gravity of the Big Bang affected space and time. They found right. that the beginning is a curved mirror. <laughs> <laughs> yes, see, there you go. Victor vindicated once again. And, and for those of you who may not know, uh, Victor Anderson was our teacher and, uh, and uh, I wrote a book about him called Victor Anderson, an American Shaman. And, uh, and we are a part of his tradition. So, um, hmm. so what do you see in like this deep and unique passion uh, that you feel could, could be found in any person from any culture, path or faith? You know, how would you encourage people through the reading of your book to feel that they can connect and embrace the elements of courting the wild queen themselves. Mm. It's all relational. <laughs> And wherever you are, you live in a body. You live as a body that is made up of matter and energy that were part of the birth of everything. And it's come into its own unique particular form. So a part of the everything can experience itself from outside itself in a way that's never been experienced before. And we, if we take a step back and take a very broad view of the place where we are right now, and treat it very gently, we can see that we've tried to experiment with going as far away from everything else as we possibly can to see if we would still exist and to see if we would still be ourselves. And we've come up against that limit. We might even, some might even say that we've really gone beyond what can really be sustained in terms of that limit. Mm -hmm. And so um, the only way forward is turning back <laughs> in some profound ways. And I want to ask you in a moment to speak of something Victor spoke of in, in this regard, but uh, just to finish that thought. Um, and it's not that we're all going to wear bear skins and go into caves and live off of what we can hunt and forage. Mm -hmm. Some people might, but, um, but it's, it's not that we are going to forget and erase and eliminate everything that's come in the past 6,000 years, mm -hmm. but rather that we need to, that we've been going in one particular direction for the past 6,000 years or so. And that direction has been away and apart. And now that we've gone as far away and as far apart as we can go without being torn apart ourselves, we need to begin the return. And that return begins by coming into our own bodies, coming into our own senses and going out and engaging what's directly around us, wherever we are. I had someone years ago who felt very sad because she said she, there was no way for her to connect to the wild because she lived in an apartment that was hard for her to, to leave and there weren't really any parks around. And I said, well, um, are there any spiders in your house? And I told her to every day go and look at the spider webs and go and pay, and pay attention to what the spiders were doing because 
anything that's outside our civilization's control is wildness, is the life of the world unfurling. And so if the, if the one bit of wildness you can find is a spider making a web in the corner of your house, that's enough. You can actually begin going right. back, reweaving the connection there. One of my very favorite things to do is to spend, send people who are able to walk out walking around their neighborhoods to find the one tree that really calls to them and mm -hmm. have them each day spend just five minutes in the presence of that tree, not speaking and paying attention to their own heartbeat and to the presence of the tree. And that changes everything for people. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, it's like so many think that one has to make these huge changes or re-embrace re uh, an entire uh, way of being or a culture of the past. But in actuality, there's a lot in the past that was very painful and, and, and was unnecessary, but was culturally embraced in that time. Uh, Victor used to say that we have to allow ourselves to become refined and, that, and to really um, understand what that means. And, uh, and that that was part of the evolution of the human spirit is to take the best of the past and to refine it and bring it into the future so that the future does not hold the pain of the past. And didn't he speak of the Sankofa bird in that regard? Yes, 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 he did. But that that's very traditional lore. Okay, so, so Sean, um, it's, what else would you like to uh, add about the the nuance of your book. How 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 do you feel that um, it, uh, it that that it spoke to you and what it and what it brought to you and and how this book all came together. Hmm. Ultimately, the the writing of this book was a pilgrimage and a rite in itself. It was a journey of transformation that began with a call from the other world speaking to me in a moment of being broken open. Um, that then led me along, along a golden thread across a vast abyss and wove in ways quite differently than I expected on one level, but on another level in ways that have played out again and again across time and space at the level of the mythic. And I think it's very important um, to speak a little bit about that word and its meaning because in our culture today, we tend to think of a myth as something that's not true or as a made up explanation for something. And that's because this is a layer of reality that our culture tends not to dip into very readily. And while there are some modern fantasy writers like Tolkien who are very much it have been who were and are and have been very much in touch with that level of reality and who speak in a mythic register. Mm -hmm. There is a difference between fantasy and myth. Fantasy is in many ways a modern invention. It is a literary genre of imagined worlds 
whereas the mythic is a layer of reality. And I think about um, in uh, one of the poems in the book, um, I'm, I actually quote the ferryman uh, on the ferry from Dingle to Kilronan um, off the west coast of Ireland almost directly, where as I was getting off the boat, he looked at me and said, the ferryman knows something about the underworld. And then he said, history on this island exists in layers. Go to Don Angus and you will understand. And Don Angus is the ancient stone ring fort over the cliffs that's dedicated to the Irish God of love. And I made a literal pilgrimage across the island on foot to, um, to that port that day. And as I walked across that, the island, I was walking in more than one world at once, just as I was in the moment when that ferryman spoke to me. And we think in this culture of other worlds as distant places or as metaphors. But in reality, there are many layers to our world all the time. I was listening this morning to um, an amazing uh, philosopher and anatomist, Gil Headley, who was talking about the layers of the body and about how you first have the layer of the skin and then beneath the skin, you have the fatty tissue and beneath that you have the fascia and beneath that you have the muscles and the organs and beneath that you have the bone. And that's the same way if you dig in the earth, you first had the layer of topsoil and then you hit clay and then you hit gravel and then you hit water and then you hit bedrock. And so the mythic is a layer of reality in the same sense that the clay is a layer of the soil or the bone is a deep layer of our body. Uh, and so it feels important to approach things in that way, that the fact that the language is poetic doesn't mean that it's merely figurative or merely imaginal. It speaks of a different layer of reality. And in many ways, it is the most direct way of speaking what I was experiencing through the writing of the book. Wow. So do you feel that, that anyone, no matter what their religion or path or faith, that they could embrace this type of approach and have similar experiences <laughs> that are appropriate to them. Yes, but it becomes important not to hold too tightly to belief because you know, belief is a, fair, is a fairly modern concept in a lot of ways. The mm -hmm. idea that whether we think something exists or not, what it is, or whether we think we know something about the nature of something or not is what's important. And in reality, um, encountering things as they are mm -hmm. is what's important. And right. so the world is speaking to us all the time. It's only our expectations that stop us from hearing what's being spoken. And as long as you have a beating heart and you can bring your attention to your beating heart and you can find one tree and stand with that tree and bring your attention to your heartbeat and then bring your attention to the tree, you can experience the world speaking to you. Uh, this was something that Stephen Buhner taught me uh, very beautifully. Something that I had experienced, but that I hadn't understood in a systematic way before I knew him. And um, absolutely, there are people who, just as there are people who are 
more adept at carpentry and there are people who are more adept at cooking there are people who are more adept at engaging all of these layers of reality at once and in traditional cultures the priests and the shamans were the one and the witches were the ones who held a larger degree of that role on behalf of the community but everybody in the community did some of it and everybody was all everybody was aware of the multiple levels of reality and the fact that you could step from one level to another fairly seamlessly and then you needed to be paying attention to what the world was speaking to you all the time and in fact i think that remembering that is the only thing that will allow us to survive as a species in this era well, Sean, it's certainly been an adventure with the writing with you, and I, I am so grateful to have my small part in it. And um, thank you so much for uh, your courage and and uh, tenderness of heart that you have shared with the world and the, the history and the beauty of it. I think that that's just amazing. And, and thank you very much for your time in this interview. Well, thank you so much for being one of the midwives of this book <laughs> and for uh, all that you share with me and everyone in your web of connection and for this time together tonight. All right, well, blessed be. That's a good